A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, Abraham did not doubt God's promise in unbelief. Rather, he was empowered by faith and gave glory to God and was fully convinced that what God had promised, he was also able to do. That is why it was credited to him as righteousness. But it was not for him alone that it was written that it was credited to him. It was also for us, to whom it will be credited, who believe in the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over for our transgressions and was raised for our justification. Fair pum domini. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. Dominus Fabiscum, et con spiritum tuo, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Lucam, Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to share the inheritance with me. He replied to him, Friend, who appointed me as your judge and arbitrator? Then he said to the crowd, Take care to guard against all greed. For though one may be rich, one's life does not consist of possessions. Then he told them a parable. There was a rich man whose land produced a bountiful harvest. He asked himself, What shall I do? For I do not have space to store my harvest. And he said, this is what I shall do. I shall tear down my barns and build larger ones. There I shall store all my grain and other goods. And I shall say to myself, now as for you, you have so many good things stored up for many years. Rest, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this night your life will be demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, to whom will they belong? Thus will it be for the one who stores up treasure for himself, but is not rich in what matters to God. Verbum Domini.
Today, in the first reading from Romans and from the Gospel today in Luke, we're pointed towards God, to trust in Him, to believe in Him, that that's our, our true will. Romans gives a beautiful reflection on justification, that it's through our focus, our belief, our personal entrustment to Christ that we are justified. He said, for the one who believes in the one who raised Jesus, our Lord from the dead, who was handed over for our transgressions and was raised for our justification. We have something greater than what was given to Abraham. He was called from a distant land to come to the land flowing with milk and honey and to be a father of a multitude of nations, despite his, he and Sarah's old age. We're offered justification in Jesus Christ, and this is a radical transformation. Paul speaks of us being new creations in Christ, that he makes us new, he transforms us, he has mercy upon us, he wipes away our sins through baptism and sacraments, of confession, sanctifying grace given to us in baptism, increased in the Eucharist, deepening gift of the Holy Spirit in confirmation, that's justification. We have to absolutely get that we're born in original sin. We lost that grace in the Garden of Eden. We lost, due to original sin, this eternal life, this uh, original holiness, this original justice that we were born in. We lost that. We inherit that because we all belong to that one family. Adam and Eve are our original parents. And Jesus renews us, restores us. He gives, he justifies us by a, this free gift that through faith. Catholicism in our tradition, we have this a concept of being able to merit grace, but that original justification given to us in baptism is a free gift. We baptize infants, right, based on uh, the faith of the parents, the faith of the church that presupposes all uh, sacramental life but that infant doesn't merit it. The adult who's baptized through RCIA today, we would say, uh, if he's not baptized, right, he can't merit that first grace of justification. That's a free gift that we have by faith. He loves us. That's why he does this for us. And after that initial justification, we can merit, but we can't merit final perseverance. That's also a gift to us. And so faith and grace are beautiful things. It's uh, something we cooperate with, but it's this great work that God is doing uh, for us. And Romans highlights the witness of Abraham that, you know, he did not, Romans tells us today, Abraham did not doubt God's promise and unbelief. He obeyed, he left his homeland, went to a place flowing with milk and honey, a strange land, and became a father of a multitude of nations. This was what was promised to him, and he obeyed. He left modern-day Iraq and went to the land of Canaan, this land flowing with milk and honey. When he was first told of this plan, he was 75 years old. And then 25 years later, it gets fulfilled. That's faith. You know, he appears, God appears to him when he's 99 and says, this time next year, you know, Sarah will be with child. Sarah is beyond childbearing years. She is of, of advanced age. So Paul tells us in Romans, Abraham was empowered by faith, you know, to make this journey. Sarah was empowered to conceive by faith. That's an image that strengthening, that renewing, is an image of what Jesus is doing for us spiritually because by justification we have the Holy Spirit, we have God's life in us and certainly driven by the gifts of the Holy Spirit we're empowered, empowered to persevere, empowered to do uh, great works for the Lord. And then in faith we know the story of Abraham is prepared to offer Isaac in sacrifice his son, his only son, whom he loved very much, right? He was ready to offer him in sacrifice to God and faith. We see in the life of Abraham, and it's true for us, and the Catechism is a beautiful section on this, that faith 
is first of all a personal adherence of man to God. <clears throat> that we entrust ourselves to him. We say here, as the prophets say in the Old Testament, you know, here I am, Lord, send me. I'm ready, I'm ready. Peter says it in the New Testament. You know, John chapter six, where else can we go? We've come to believe that you are the Messiah, the Holy One of God. You have the words of everlasting life. We can't find that anywhere else on this world. We can't find this in ourselves. You are the Savior. You are the one that empowers us, gives us grace. So faith is this personal adherence to Christ. We encounter God in some way. We entrust ourselves to him. And it's an ascent to the whole truth that God has revealed. It's an ascent to doctrine, to truth, in that sense of what he's revealed to us. A human act in the sense that we submit our intellect and will to God who reveals, reveals himself in the Old Testament in his plan of salvation for us. As I mentioned in the beginning, all this is still a gift. It's a human act and it's a gift that for us to believe it must be preceded by grace. We must have an interior help of the Holy Spirit who proceeds and assists moving the heart and turning it to God. And the mystery is how our freedom is maintained in that. We have a free will. God preserves that, moving our heart by his grace. So that's a gift. So it's even that's made possible by God. But we receive this revelation, we entrust ourselves to God, and we give the human response to the God who reveals himself by the obedience of faith, which Paul talks about in Romans in the first chapter, and in the last chapter, Abraham's the model of this obedience. Not just, Lord, Lord, but, you know, Lord, what is your will? Help me to hear and to obey it. So faith has a twofold reference to the person of God himself and to the truth that he has revealed. And by trusting, you know, by trusting in this person through the encounter, we believe what he has revealed to us. Our tradition has a beautiful explanation that we have motives of credibility to believe. We have the miracles of Christ. We have the miracles of the saints. We have fulfilled prophecies. We see the church's growth and stability over 2,000 years. We see her fruitfulness, the life of charity, especially and her saints and all the good works. This gives testimony that this is a supernatural endeavor, that God is you know, moving it and sustaining it. So that, you know, we have those motives, reasons to believe. So our faith is in accordance with reason, but we don't believe because it's reasonable. We believe in God and on the authority of God himself who reveals it to us. We can trust in his word and his authority that he will not deceive us. So we believe in God, what he's revealed to us, that the Father has sent his Son, the eternal word, the fullness of revelation. We're told in Mark's gospel that the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel that in Christ there is the fulfillment of all that God wants us to know, the plan for our salvation, what we need to know to be saved, that there is an objective content to revelation. There's something true and, and propositional that we believe about our faith. We hold these truths, right, and believe in them. All that Jesus said and did, he is you know, the Old Testament prepares for his coming and he fulfills all that in his person and what he, he left us uh, through the apostles. So we say that eternal word comes to us today through scripture and tradition as handed on to us by the apostles, preserved by them and their successors. Second Thessalonians say, Hold, holds fast to the traditions that you were taught, that all that they, they said and did so this revelation which we believe and cling to comes to us through scripture and tradition. It is the two font 
two fonts of the one source of the eternal word, that he is that fullness that comes to us through scripture, what's written down in our Bible, so to speak, and tradition, what's handed on to us by the church. Now, Vatican II defines tradition, you know, this, what is handed on by the apostles, is, it says, now what was handed on by the apostles includes everything which contributes toward the holiness of life and increase in faith of the peoples of God. And so the church in our teaching, life, and worship perpetuates and hands on to all generations all that she herself is, all that she believes. In another magisterial document, documents, it says the tradition is handed on by oral preaching, by their example, by their ordinances, what they themselves had received, the apostles, whether from the lips of Christ, from his way of life and his works, or by coming to know it through the prompting of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> those, that deposit of faith in Jesus Christ <clears throat> was handed on to those apostles and those who assisted them and that revelation ended with the death of the last apostle. So that, that is the content of our faith. We really believe in something, and we can't change that. The Holy Spirit helps us to penetrate it, to understand it, to develop our, and grow in our understanding, but we cannot change that deposit. And the scriptures, you know, they come to us, they're to be proclaimed, heard, read, received, and experienced as the work of God in the stream of the apostolic tradition from which it is inseparable. So even for us to pick up our Bibles and understand it, we need that stream of tradition through which the scriptures come to us, how the canon is defined by the authority of the church, and to understand it through magisterial teachings, you know, through the witness of the saints, you know, through the church fathers. That's how we can understand what God speaks to us in his scriptures. I say all that because <clears throat> it seems like, you know, just the notion of itself, the notion of truth itself is challenged today and relativized. And we have a spirit of the world that's constantly attacking that and challenging that belief in any objective truth. And in many ways, it seems the church is the last house on the block to protect this notion of truth. Philosophy should, if it's in accordance with right reason, but we have a darkened intellect, a weakened will, our motives can mess up our, our knowledge and understanding, and that can be subject to the frailty of the current of the times. And we can look at our own history in this country and just see how beliefs, you know, cultural mores have been all over the map and has changed so much. Jesus challenges us today in the Gospels not to store up treasures for ourselves. These worldly treasures that we are tempted to rely on is fleeting. He tells us to be rich in what matters to God. This revelation that he has entrusted to his church, which he is the bearer of, is a sure foundation to build our life on. We encounter Christ, we believe in him, we stake our lives on him. We can lose money overnight, we can lose health overnight. If our God, our false idol, is power and control, that's sand, that's building an edifice uh, of our life on sand, that's shifting. He's telling us to be rich in our faith, to be rich in grace that he has poured out upon us in a sacramental life through faith, to be rich in holiness, to be rich in a relationship with Jesus, that if we're bonded to him, if we know him, if we're seeking his will, we can walk through anything in this life with him. He can strengthen us and empower us. Pope Benedict, Emeritus Benedict said, and it's often quoted by Pope Francis that this faith is a result of an encounter with Christ. We've met him in some way, and we're challenged to hold on to that precious encounter, to foster it by works of charity, by prayer and meditation, by immersing ourselves in, in good and holy things. 
That's how we grow in, in the riches that matters most to God. And that can produce a fruitfulness and a stability to our life where the culture will take us down a, a different road. May we be faithful to this revelation and, and share it with others.